Greetings, friends. Welcome to another Precept Upon Precept video class. The title of this special series is Fundamentals of Our Union with Christ. This is the most awesome, beautiful truth that could be in the whole universe, and I'm so glad that you joined with us to see what it is the Father's saying at this time. We welcome you. We welcome every hungry heart. We welcome everyone that wants to go on with God, and especially we welcome those who've fallen in love with Jesus. Not the Jesus out there somewhere, but the Christ that's in you. That's what this is all about. That's what the Christ life is all about. And we're thankful that the Lord has allowed us to have this good information, and that he gives us the opportunity to share it with you. And of course, what we really want is for you to begin to share it with somebody else. The only way people will ever really begin to live, I mean really live, is when they begin to see Christ as their only life. You see, I don't believe that most church members are really living. I think they kind of exist. I think they are beat between pillar and post in what to do and how to do it uh, religiously and how to serve God, how not to carry on in the work of the Lord and so forth. I think there are a whole lot of things that people are just... Uh, existing in and not really living, haven't really come to live. You have the freedom to live by the Christ that is in you. Isn't that glorious? That's wonderful. You are now free to live, to be who God intended that you be. In fact, God made you in the image and likeness of Jesus and he has fixed it so that you could begin to be that very thing which he has made you to be. Well, we are in class once again here in our studio classroom in Dallas, and we have a live audience with us once again. And so we're just thrilled and blessed to be able to talk about Jesus to the class here as well as to you who are viewing. In our lesson today, we're going into some verses of scripture. Up until now, in the first lessons which we have discussed, we have attempted to point out the imminency of the great truth in the scripture of the in Christ position. Now that's sort of a technical term, in Christ position. But you see, that's what you are. You're in Christ. That's your position. That's where you stand before God. Now your daily walk may not be that, and that's the reason why we're teaching and preaching these marvelous, glorious truths. But the simple facts are you're in Christ. That's your position with God. Now, that ought to take a great stress off of you, ought to relieve you greatly, because if, if you could ever get it fixed in your mind that God sees you perfect by the Christ that's in you, for he has made Christ to be your very life. If you could ever get that in your mind, you could go on and live. You could live in joy and happiness and blessing as you've never before. And that's the reason why we're coming to you and why we want you to get a hold of these blessed truths and begin to grow in them. So up until now, we have uh, centered our attention on the fact that the Bible teaches that we're in Christ, that the believer is a Christian because Christ is his very life. We have stated, for instance, that there are over 200 occasions where this is stated in the New Testament. In fact, over 200 times the scripture uses the term in Christ or a, a term synonymous to that, in him, in the beloved, in whom, and so forth. Uh, 146 of those times we see that the original language, the Greek language of which the New Testament is comprised, states that the believer is a union with Christ. That means they're one. Doesn't mean that uh, Christ has ceased to be in the believer as everything, or that the believer has ceased to be in Christ as everything, we uh, would never even assume an idea, not even an iota of an idea, uh, that the believer is Christ. But he has come into union with Christ so that they are one to the Father. Now, you see, believers are never going to be uh, perfect to other believers. We're certainly as believers not going to be perfect to the world, but we stand perfect before God because Christ is our life. And 146 times at least, the New Testament verifies the fact that the believer is one with Christ. Christ is not only in him, but he's in union with Christ. We are in union with this Christ so that we are literally swallowed up and as Paul said, Christ is all. He's all and in all who have been born again. 
So we have attempted up until now to establish that fact that Christ is in the believer. He's not outside the believer. The only Christ there is for a believer is the Christ that is in the believer. But what we haven't done thus far is to go into some of these verses which uh, verify this tremendous truth of in Christ's position. And that's what we're going to begin to do with this lesson today we're going to begin to see some of the verses of Scripture that just literally explode with the glory of God bringing forth this tremendous message. That's right, we're a message. Uh, A lot of people don't like the idea that I say we're a message, but I take that from the first chapter of 1 John, his epistle, where he says, this then is the message which we have heard of him. Now, certainly I'm not bringing a message about Christ. That would be foolish. That I did for years, and nobody could uh, really grow in that. Uh, or come to great knowledge in that. Uh, it isn't about Christ. We're, pre- we're preaching Christ. We're not preaching that he gives life. We're preaching that he is life. We're not preaching that Jesus gives us anything. We're preaching that he is all and in all of us. That's the truth of the Christ life message. Christ is in us. And these verses of scripture, which we're going to sort of take out of the setting, I'll tell you that right uh, from the start. We're going to take some verses of scripture right from their setting, and I don't think that we'll change the, the uh, whole of what's being said in that portion of Scripture in the context, but we want to see, I want you to see some of the powerful verses of Scripture in the New Testament, particularly what Paul has to say, that verify this tremendous fact that we're in Christ. And I want you to see how words before and after the statement in Christ are given to us. One more thing I want you to see. The term in Christ is a doctrinal statement. It's not just a colloquialism of Paul. It's not just a connotation of the way Paul talked. It is a doctrinal statement. Therefore, it is the strongest and the most often given single doctrinal statement in the New Testament. Now, does not seem like that ought to have a great weight of expression on our part? Does not seem like we ought to because of its tremendous weight in the amount of scripture, spend a lot of time talking about it. I say that because every once in a while I come in contact with somebody who says, well, you ought not to be so imbalanced. You need balance in the preaching of the gospel. And I always say to these people, what do you mean when you say we need balance? And they say, well, you need to preach uh, that Jesus does this and he does that and uh, he heals and he's coming back and he, he fills with the spirit and he takes care of our needs. He does all of these things. You need to preach a whole gospel. My friend, it isn't what he does that gives us life. I think that's one of the most difficult things for people to receive who are really not hungry for God. If you're really hungry for God, it doesn't matter. You want Christ because he's the bread, he's the food. But if you're really not hungry for God, it's hard for you to receive the fact that it isn't what he does, it's who he is that gives us life. You see, there is no life in what he, what he gives. He never gives life, he is life. He didn't give his life for me, he became me in death. I died in him. My life was poured into him, and when he died, I died. Now, that's different than him giving death to me. And then when he came out of the grave, I came out of the grave with him. That's what we mean by identification. He didn't give me resurrection. He didn't give me life. I came out of the grave with him. And that's the glorious truth that we have. And so you got to get the the idea separated that he's given us something. And and I'll say it again, if you're really not hungry for God, you'll want him to keep on giving you things. But when you get hungry for God, you'll want him, he, himself. And that's what we're stressing here. And that's why some of these verses of scripture are so potent and powerful to our understanding. The very first one we're gonna look at is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, we have laid out for us almost the whole plan of God, let's say. Uh, not actually, but it just appears to me at times that the whole plan of God is laid out in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. In this uh, particular verse of scripture, the apostle Paul says, therefore, I read from King James Version, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Now, if you've got your Bible handy, I want you to circle that. Circle that statement, in Christ. Uh, you ought to always circle every statement in Christ that you come across or a synonymous term to, to it. And if you don't want to circle it, we'll underline it. Because you've got to see that this is not 
just a prepositional phrase, but that this is what God is trying to say to human beings, that now that you're born again, you're in Christ. So let's read the whole verse through first, and then I'll go back and comment on it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, several things that we want to discuss in this one verse of Scripture. It is a pivotal truth, a, a, a basic verse of Scripture for the Christ life because it explains and denotes in Christ's position as great and powerfully as any other verse of scripture we come up with. Now, you'll notice the very first word is therefore. That means that it is a summation of the things that have previously been said. A, a powerful verse is the verse just preceding it, verse 16, uh, which declares that uh, we no more know any man after the flesh, not even do we know Jesus after the flesh. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The word therefore is a summation of what has been said previously in the context. What it is saying is there is a whole new existence available. There is a whole new idea. That's what the word therefore is introducing to us. Now, if I didn't put this introduction to the talking about this verse, previous to talking about this verse, you might get a little excited with me because I'm going to say things in this verse that are really, uh, I think, powerful and are things which we don't too often hear and we need to hear them more often than we do. I'm going to talk to you about what is new with God. What God intended would be absolutely new to the born again believer. The word therefore introduces it. The very second word is the word if. Now, it might do you well to circle this word if because this is not an added word to the text. This is a word that was given by uh, Paul, we might say, as he originally spoke these words in the epistle to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. If. What he means now is to say that I'm going to talk about something so powerful and so great and so outstanding, so brand new to the human race, that there may be some who don't grasp it, don't get it, or there may be some to whom it is not intended. Now, by that, I mean, he says, if any man be in Christ, these things apply. So I have to tell you, dear friend, that it is only by in Christ position that you ever come to what it is God is saying and doing. You can't have what it is God's saying and doing unless you know that you're in Christ. Now, I, I want to comment on that by saying that there are multitudes of believers who are in Christ and don't know it. Every person who's saved, born again, regenerated, uh, whatever it is they call their salvation, everyone that is saved has Christ in them. Now, you understand that? We want to make that very clear because you might think that we have some sort of an elitist message and we're an elitist people and that we're something in, within ourselves. We're not. The only thing that makes us any different to any other human being is Christ but that doesn't make us different from any other Christian because all Christians have Christ in them who have been born again. That's what was birthed in you was Christ, Christ in you, your hope of glory. So I want to make that very clear along the way as we study this, that there are no elite believers. There's no special believers. Everyone that's been birthed by our Father has the same life in them, the same Christ in them that the other has. So there's no real difference. The only difference is the outer form and the outer man of human beings that makes them appear to be different. But all this is outer. Inwardly, Christ is life, he's all, and everyone is the same in that regard. So when the Apostle Paul says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's not saying that there are some who have Christ in them who don't possess this. What he's saying is that you must be born again if any man is in Christ. Now we need to make that very plain. You are not born again. If you are not born again, you're not in Christ. 
You can't be in Christ by uh, taking on promises, words, confessing it, uh, just repenting and saying. You're in Christ by birthing. You're in Christ by special baptism. For by one spirit have we all been baptized into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. You're in Christ by a God-operated act of love. God placing his son in you. That's how you got in Christ. Christ in you, you in Christ. So not everybody who might think they're in Christ is unless they know they've been born again. Now I want to make that very clear. I've said it so many times in these lessons. You may do great works. You may have stupendous power. You may operate gifts of the Spirit. You may talk in tongues. You may uh, perform great miracles. But unless you know you've been born again, you're not in Christ. Now, Paul was ready to lift the human being to the highest purpose of his existence by the teaching that he was in Christ. That's why he comes in these first four words of this verse saying, Therefore, if any man... If any man, he's letting it be known that the criterion, the superlative position for every human being is to be in Christ. To be there, you must be born again. So he says very specifically now in the first line of this verse, therefore, if any man be in Christ. I love that idea. That means that any man can be in Christ. Not all men are in Christ. Not all men are going to be saved. Not all souls are going to come to the knowledge of God. In the end, there are going to be people who go to hell. There are going to be people rejected by God. There are people now living who in their rejection suffer the judgments of God. There are going to be people hurt. They don't have to be. They could be saved. God chose before the foundation of the world people human beings to possess Christ that they might be in Christ. That's Ephesians 1 and 4. According as God has chosen us before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. God has made it possible that everybody could be in Christ. He chose human beings to be the vessels that would possess and hold the Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ would be their very life. But not all are going to accept it. Not all are going to believe but the fact is, any man can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be lifted from the mundaneness and the death of third dimensional living into a life in the Spirit, a life in the Son, a life in Christ. God has fixed it so that any man can experience that and enjoy it. So the first line tells us that if any man be in Christ, he is something. What is the first thing he is? The first thing the man in Christ is, is a new creature. That's King James Version. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, I love the King James Version. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, most all the teaching we do will be in and out of the King James Bible. Uh, I like that Bible, uh, not because it's the best translation, but because it is the best known and it is the easiest handle of any translation for whatever some people have said who wanted to print a new Bible. I still believe that the King James is the easiest, uh, easiest handle of any translation for hungry-hearted people. Now, for people not interested in finding out what God's saying or listening to the Holy Spirit, uh, they may need the Bible broken down into... Uh, a uh, different level of understanding. But for those hungry for God, you won't beat King James. Now, I'm not telling you that it's the best translation, but I'm telling you it is the best used translation. It's one that will help you. And so we try to be common with our translation so that everybody can uh, come to the same understanding because a translation of words is very important. It is very important to seeing who and what we are in Christ by the very wording. And so if we all had different translations, we might never come to that understanding. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The, the King James Bible calls the Christian a new creature. Now, I like other translations for that word creature. For instance, the Amplified says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Well, that sort of takes it a step deeper to, to a, a little bit 
greater level of understanding. It's one thing to be a creature, to be a new creature, but sometimes that suggests to people that they're going to be made over sinners. I was once a sinner, now I'm a saint, and what's happening is I've, I've grown into the Lord. No, sinners don't grow into saints any more than rabbits grow into ducks. You, you don't change what you are. You must have a godly change. And so what sinners have happened is Satan goes out and Christ comes in and it's a whole new creation. It's a whole new creation. It's not something that is created, but it is new creation. Now, I like to make that point because some people seem to think that God is out here making Christians. He's making uh, uh, Christians uh, who, out of the Baptist doctrine, he's making Christians out of the Church of Christ doctrine, he's making Christians out of the Charismatic doctrine, making Christians out of the Methodist doctrine. No, God is not creating Christians. He's birthing them. He's birthing them. A mother and a father don't create a child. What they do is create the premise for the child. They do the acts that are necessary, but what it is that makes the child is a birthing. And believers are not just created beings, they have been birthed. And even though the King James says that we're new creatures in Christ Jesus, we're more than that. We're a whole new creation. Believers are a new creation of God. That doesn't mean necessarily he created them, but they are a new creation. They were not in existence before. So I like to amplify it on that. But I even like to go deeper than that. Johnson has a translation that, that reads, if any man be in Christ, he is a new race of people. Now, you see, that takes us much deeper yet, I feel. That's really the term I love the most. And so much of what I have to say centers in that word, a new race of people. That's what the believer is. How did he get to be that? How did the believer get to be a new race of people? How did he get to that place to where he is no longer of the previous race of people? He's a new race of people. Well, I want to talk to you about the new race uh, for just a moment. And I think to be able to do that, I want to go to the board here and talk about the new race. There are four strategic things that are identifiable in the new race of people. First, those that are in the new race have a new life. Now, do you ever stop to think what it takes to be a race of people? To be a race of people, you have to have everything different from what it was before. Uh, the simple facts are human beings could not possibly bring about a new race of people. You just couldn't do it. Uh, you, you could bring about a mixed race, but you couldn't bring about a new race. You could take a mixture of, of human beings then, and uh, mix them all together, so to speak, and uh, intermarry and uh, bring forth children by that mixture, and you would have a mixed race uh, that might be different than some other, but it wouldn't be an absolutely new race. You see, human beings can't bring about a new race because human beings can't give life within themselves. You cannot give life within yourself. Life must come from God. The Bible says, and it says it very plainly, and oh, I wish I could get this into the hearts of, of human beings. And to those of you who listen to him, I pray that the Holy Spirit uh, converge on you and bring this about. The scripture says, John says it, that the life is in the Son. Now that means there is no other life outside of Christ. There isn't, a, there isn't such a thing as a human life and then Christ life. There isn't such a thing as Christ life and then God life. The only life there is, is Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So the new life is Jesus. But what this means is that it must be Christ in you. Here you are, believer. What you need is Christ in you. You've got to come to the place that Christ is your only life. Now, in order for there to be a new race of people, a whole new creature, a new creation, there must be a, another life put in them. Well, what did you have before you were saved? What kind of life did you have? Well, it's very simple. You had death life. Now, that's the best term I can give it because Satan was your nature. 
And Satan only breeds death. If the Bible teaches us anything, it teaches us that the end of sin is death. Whosoever sinneth shall surely die. The Bible teaches us again and again that sin brings death. The end of sin is death. And Satan only rots death in human beings. So at Calvary, God put the devil out and he put Christ in the believer and for the first time the believer had life. Are you ready for that? We say human beings are living regardless. No, that isn't life. Life is in the sun. Isn't that beautiful? God never planned for human beings to live aside from Christ. He didn't plan for atheists or agnostics or people who didn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He planned only that human beings be possessed of life and that life is in the sun. So in our text that we're looking at, we're reading it now as it says, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new race of people. In order for there to be a whole new race of people, you've got to have new life. That life is in the sun. It's Christ in you. Second, if you're gonna have a new race of people, there has to be a new father. You have to have a new father. Now, you understand that? You can't have life without a father. And if Christ is our only life, the scripture calls him the seed, God's seed. So that when you were born again, God put his seed in you, Christ in you, as life. That's where you got life. You got it from Christ in you, who is God's seed. Well, now, what does that make the believer? If God put Christ in this believer and that believer then began to live Christ as his only life, what does that make the believer? Well, you got a father. You got God, who is the father, and you got this God acting in an act of love upon this believer. For God so loved the sinner that he gave his only begotten son. Peter says, that's the born again experience. Peter says, being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible. Ah, how did we get the incorruptible seed? We got a brand new father. That father acted upon us by the placing of his seed in us. What is that seed? That seed's Christ, Christ in us. That's why this message is so powerful. And that's why the whole wide world needs to hear this glorious truth. It's because the Father has put his seed in the believer. Then what does that make the believer? If God the Father is the one who places the seed, then what is the recipient of the seed? Why, it's the believer wife. That's the wife believer. That's the way we need to read that. It's the wife believer. What does that mean? That means that every believer, every human being is a wife believer to whom God can place his seed and bear in them another person, Christ in them. And that's what makes a Christian. That's the true definition of what a Christian is. Now, in order for there to be a new race, you've got to have a new father. He can't be a mixture of the old. Human beings, in order to be born again, must have a father that is not of the same limitations that they previously had. That's why Peter says, being born again, not of the corruptible seed. Not of the corruptible. What do you mean by that? The corruptible seed is what came from our earthly father, our earthly parents, our earthly existence came about by earthly parents, many of them godly, but when they conceived us, they conceived us as it were in sin because we don't come into this world born again. We come into this world by first birthing and then we wait for God's time that we might be born again. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, waiting for the time that we get a new father. Now, God may have always been father to you, but until he puts his seed in you, he has not instituted the acts and the rights that are his as a father. I'll ask you, have you been born again? Do you know that you're born again? 
You may have all the gifts of the Spirit. You may operate outwardly all of the marvelous gifts and graces that God's Word offers, but have you the assurance that God has put His seed in you and you've got a new Father? You, therefore, have new life in you, Christ in you. You know that? Do you really know that? Well, that brings us to the third term that is indicative of this new race of people, and that is the human being becomes a new person. A new person. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe that the saddest thing in Christianity is that multitudes of people have been born again but have never seen all things new. They've not become a new person. We're conglomerated with a lot of error. One of the conglomerations is that you can't change, that your personality can't change, your nature can't change. All of this is a lie. Personalities do change. Nature can change. In fact, it is the exchange of nature that Calvary brings on. That's where you got an exchange of nature, was at the cross. You had Satan nature in you. Now you have Christ nature in you by the work of the cross, by what Jesus did for the Father and for human beings at Calvary. There can be a remarkable, glorious change in your life. And that's what creates a new person. That's what's so sad. Some people just add religion. They just add churchianity. They just add works. They just add doing things they've never done before. They add going places they've never gone before. But they haven't really come to new personhood. I want to tell you something. Christ in you provides for you an extension of his personality through your personality. What do I mean by that? I mean he flows through your personality in such force when you begin to see and know him as your only life that he swamps and overwhelms your personality. What are the personality traits of Christ? We'll study this more thoroughly a little later when we get over in Galatians. What are the personality traits of Christ? That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what the white believer bears. She bears the fruit of the seed that's in her. Christ, who is her life, produces his fruit through her. She can't produce anything. Oh, we loved in a human kind of way before Christ became our life. But when Christ became our life, he moved through that channel of love with his love and his personality so that we became a new person, new personhood. All of this business about human beings thinking positive and forcing themselves by confession to become something wouldn't be necessary if they could see that the new person within them is Christ and that's the person God sees. And as they, with their mind, begin to see that same Christ as their life, they will begin to express him as a new person, a new person, praise God. So this new race of people has created new personhood. I want to say this, when you begin to take hold of who you are in Christ, everything that has to do with your old personality gets swallowed up. Now, you will always do things your way because it's Christ in you as you. That doesn't mean it's Christ as Christ. It means it's Christ as you. That's a big difference. Always remember when I make that statement, Christ in you as you, that I'm not saying that you're Christ. I'm saying that it's Christ as you. He can only, with his personality, overwhelm yours and come out of you with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentle, temperance, and so forth. That's the new personhood. This new race of people has offered to it new personhood for the glory of God. That's what the world needs to see. That's the witness believers need to make. And that's what we encourage Christ-like believers everywhere to do. Instead of them carrying a sign on their back saying, I'm a, I'm a Christian, they need to begin to live the Christ that's in them and allow that Christ nature to come out of them with all of its character and personality, fruit of the Spirit. Well, number four, this new race of people now have begun to live in a new world. They have a whole new world available for them. 
Now, I have to be very candid with you at this point because I have preached the gospel on various other levels in my lifetime and I felt comfortable with them to a degree and then I got hungry and wanted more of God. But I could have been content any number of times with past experiences with God. In fact, I can tell you that some people can live off of experiences. I did. I lived for years off of experiences. I was always getting a new experience. I didn't have life, understanding of life, but I had experiences. I was always getting resaved, recommitted, rededicated, refilled, rejuvenated, regenerated. I was always getting something read. <laughs> and the end result was I never came to living. Because if you're always working to redo, you're never really living. And the one thing that helped to settle it once and all for me that Christ and his life is the total of God's plan was that I had a new world. Whenever I saw Christ as the only me there was to God, and I began to get a hold of it then that he's the only me there is in this world, I began to walk in power, in victory, in faith, in glory, in the plan of God. I began to walk that way. Why? Because it didn't matter what took place in the world, I was more than conqueror. How was I more than conqueror? My life was more than conqueror. I was at peace. How was I at peace? The Prince of Peace was my life. I was in love. How was I love? In love. God the lover was in me. He was me. That's what I was. So my world began to change. I didn't change the world, but my world begin to change around me by attitude and by understanding. No longer was I frustrated and confused trying to straighten out the world and trying to work out everything. Far from it. Now for the first time, I had a new world. A new world. Same old devil out there. Still a lot of people claiming that it was his world. Still communism. Still nuclear age. Still all of the vices, pornography, abortion, criminals, alcoholism, still all those things. But marvelously, I was in a new world because those things no longer mattered. It wasn't that I was better than anybody else. It was that my world was new. I was a new race of people living in a new world. We have lots of scripture for that. The Apostle Paul earmarked this new world relationship when he said it doesn't matter whether I live or die. Isn't that something? Most of us do care whether we live or die. We fight every day to try to live. Paul said it doesn't matter whether I live or die. What did he have? He had a whole new world. It, was, it didn't matter. A lot of the things that was happening in life didn't matter anymore. Whichever way they went, he was victorious. Wouldn't you like to have a world like that? Wouldn't that be glorious to live in a world that whether you're sick or healthy, whether you lived or died, whether you had or didn't have, whether you're rich or poor, it didn't matter? Well, you say, what are you, a pacifist? No, I'm a realist who knows who he is. I know who I am, and that has produced for me a whole new world. There's a new world in Christ Jesus. If you continue on in your old way of doing things, thinking the same, you, you're going to be enveloped by the old world that's out there that there's never going to be a change in. The church is not going to change the world. The church is not God's answer to this world. The answer was Christ. Christ is the answer. Now, the church is made up of all the people who see this truth, but the church is not what's going to clear the problems up in this world. It's you see in Christ as your life. So the new race of people live in a new world. Four vibrant things that this new race of people have. They have a new Christ life. They have a new father. They have a new personhood. And they live in a new world.
What more could God do for us? I ask you, what more could God possibly do for us than that? He's given us everything we need to exist here and now so that we lack for nothing. Why? Who is it that lacks for nothing? It's he who is me, Christ in me. My union with him, my understanding of that union makes me lack for nothing. I lack for nothing in Christ. Well, we need to get past the second line in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Thus far we have seen, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new race of people. Next line says, old things are passed away. Old things are passed away. Now, I'm sure when you read a line like that, your first reaction is like mine has always been. When in the world did old things pass away? I was talking to somebody this past Saturday who kept telling me the memories. The memories out of my past have come up against me again and again, and they are defeating me. Oh, I said, that's one of the things that was supposed to have passed away. Oh, they said, is that so? That's right. I said, if you've been born again, if you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, the old memories are passed away. Well, now, we don't teach that much, do we? I remember when I was a sort of a Christian psychologist, I was helping people to get healed of their memories. I was always taking them back into the past and trying to resolve and, and deal with these things. I wasn't standing on God's Word. Of course, that's a pretty powerful thing among psychologists and counselors, but I wasn't standing on God's Word. Why? If I had stood on God's Word, I would bring that person to the renewal of his mind to where he sees he is a new race of people, and as a result of it, everything out of the past race has passed away. Passed away. Uh, maybe that's a sweet way of saying it's dead. But you say, I still have these feelings. That's because you don't know who you are. Well, I still got these bad memories. That's because you don't know you're a new race of people. You see, those are thought patterns. What happens when you're born again? Your mind becomes renewed. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. What happens to the mind once you're born again? It begins to be renewed. The renewed mind begins to say, hey, I'm a new person. I'm a new creature. Those things don't apply anymore. They don't apply anymore. All things are passed away. It means something else, this line. It means not only are the old things out of our past passed away, but the old relationships out of our past are swallowed up and passed away. This is not an easy subject to deal with. But it means your first birthing, your natural birthing, is what's passed away. What does that mean? That means that your first birthing, your mom and daddy who produced you, are no longer to hold the sway over the new creation race that you become a part of. See, that's not easy to assimilate into our thinking, is it? Jesus had to do this. Jesus was the Son of God, but he had to make a division between the old things which helped to bring him into the world and who he was as God's Son. He did this several times. He did this by separating himself from Mary, uh, who was his mother originally, mother of Jesus, we say. But when Jesus began his ministry, the first thing he did at Cana of Galilee was to separate himself from his mother, and he said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? From then on, he never referred to her as mother or Mary. It was always woman. Why? Old things had passed away. Oh, it was not disrespect. It was true respect for who and what he was as God's son. That's very important. You remember one time Mary and his brothers and sisters in the, in the flesh came to see him at a meeting, and uh, they announced that your mother and brothers and sisters are here, and Jesus retorted back, uh, I have no mother and brothers and sisters except those who do the will of my father. What did he do? He lifted the understanding to the new race to the new relationship where God was the Father, where God was the Father. Now I have to be very pointed with you, and I must say that the reason why Christianity don't work and this new life in Christ doesn't work for a lot of believers is that they won't allow these old things to pass away. 
They believe in Jesus, but they're holding on to the past. They're holding on to mother and to home and to the past and to relationship. And God knows we don't want to be disrespectful of these things. But if you're going to grow up in Christ and if you're going to ever come to be who you are, you're going to have to handle that sooner or later. You're going to have to handle that sooner or later. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new race of people and old things are passed away. Now that ought to be plain enough. Because you're a new race of people and you have a new father and you have a new life in Christ, all of these old things have passed away. I shall never forget a couple who took this to heart one time in one of our institutes, Christ Life Institutes, who began to see that the old things had passed away and until they were passed away, people wouldn't come to the vibrancy of who they were in Christ. This man, a real man of God, gathered his family around him, had a son and a daughter, and he called them in one day with his wife and set them down, and he said, I want to tell you, now that we're seeing Christ as our all, I want you to know your real true Father in the Spirit is God the Father. And your attachment to me as Father must give way to Him as your real Father now that you've been birthed. When I heard him tell this, it really jarred me. But I thought that's what Paul said. That's what Jesus did. They handle the old things. They handle the corruptible seed. Peter said being born again, not of the corruptible seed. What did that mean? That meant that the first birthing was done away with. That natural birthing, not, not of the corruptible seed. No disrespect there. But there is allegiance and faith in this new father and his birthing. So old things are passed away. If I'm talking to somebody now that's wrestling with the old things, let me encourage you that the Christ in you would love to lift you to another understanding to where the old things didn't matter anymore. They don't matter. Most of the old things you wrestle with are not going to change. You're not going to get a miracle in them. You're not going to bring up the past and deal with it again. God's not interested in that. The now. We're in the now. You remember that from past lessons? Now. Right now we're sons of God. Now there's no condemnation. Now God is moving in our midst. Right now. We're now people. We're the now generation. And you need to come to the now. You need to leave the past behind and come to the now. People come to me and say, well, I've always had this problem. I've always been this. I've always been that. Listen, if you knew who you were in Christ, always what you were is passed away. That's right. It'll pass away. Somebody said to me the other day, why is it that so many Christians are still not good examples? That's because they were not good examples before they were Christian and they just added Christianity and they're still not very good people. They're not very good in their relationship with others. Old things must pass away. Behold, now we're ready for the latter part of this verse. Behold, all things are become new. Now, I feel I ought to comment on this term, all things, because along in this study, we're going to come across all things again and again. That's the catch-all term of the Apostle Paul. He uses it for everything he talks about. He says three times, for instance, all things are of God, or a statement similar to that. All things work together for the good. He uses that term again and again. In the original Greek, it simply means what it says. Everything in existence, all things are of God. All things are become new. Well now, that's a new revelation, isn't it? That means that nothing changes around you in the world, but everything becomes new to you. Ah, what really changed? Well, you did not really change, but you had an exchange, and in that exchange, the world became what was God's intention from the beginning. I'll tell you about the world. It's really no different now than it was the day God kicked Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. It really hadn't changed. Still sin, still Satan, still the horribleness of, of uh, rebellion. 
It really hadn't changed. It just puts on many different masks and it goes many different directions today. But it really hadn't changed. There is no basic change in sin and Satan. And there's not going to be during our day. And I don't want to disillusion anybody, but during our day, there's not going to be any change with sin and Satan. They're going to be here. They're never going to be any worse in our day than they've already been. We have promise for that as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. And right when Jesus comes, it's going to be its worst and we're going to be taken away with the Lord. So it'll never be any worse than it's already been. That's good news because we will uh, continue. But the world not changing becomes brand new to you. That's the miracle of salvation. It becomes brand new to you because you're a new person and you now view the world not as Satan's world, but as God's world made and created for the distinctive purpose and plan of God which is in operation in your life. So now we see that old things pass away and behold, all things are become new. It is my prayer by talking about these things today that there'll be a new world for you. One fella talks about the world tomorrow. Don't have to wait. It's the world right now that Christ in you lives in that you can be victorious over. You can be happy about. Oh, we're not gonna take away the hurt and the pain that's in this world but it's only gonna last a little while for we who are looking for the coming of Jesus. And in that little while, you and I can rest assured that God will not fail us. So this verse is rather explosive, you see. We're a people who have a brand new existence. That's what a Christian is. He ought to have a brand new existence. I wanna ask you, do you feel that way about your life? Do you feel since you've been born again that you have a brand new existence? Well, I gotta tell you something about people. I come in contact constantly with people who've been saved for years, joined the church, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, operate spiritual gifts, who say to me, preacher, I'm just finding out what it means to be born again. I'm just finding out about it. I'm just finding out who I am. Well, that's what the message of the Christ life is all about. It's to help you come into a brand new existence in Christ Jesus. Let me encourage you that it's there, it's waiting for you to accept it and to believe in it. If you have a need, if you hurt, if you're sick in your body, I'm gonna give you the solution, the real solution. May not take away your hurt and sickness, but I'm gonna give you the solution to your hurt and sickness. If you have a need, if you would see Jesus as your life, if you would ask the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ in you, if you would have God the Father to meet your need, I'm gonna tell you how I believe he'd do it and do it perfectly. He would reveal more of his Son in you. You see, if you could just see more of the Son in you, everything else would be swallowed up. Everything else would come under subjection to that Jesus who has overcome death, hell, and the grave already. God doesn't have two sons. He only has his son, his only begotten son, and that son that's in you, they are the same. Christ in you, Christ in you, just one son. So God will meet all of your needs by showing you more of his son. And when you see more of Jesus, You'll have the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding to press in and to do the greater things that God has promised would happen to those who followed Christ.